Welcome to those of you who are joining via Facebook, YouTube, however you happen to come across us. We're glad to have you here, but we'd much rather have you here in the sanctuary with us. Lord God, this morning we lift up this service, and for one reason and one reason only, and that is to expound upon your word. We pray, Father God, that the word is issued, that is issued today is your word and your word only. We know, Father God, that your word will not return void, but Father God, let it go out and find our hearts that are anointed in preparation for your word. Let that word, Lord God, take root within us, and Lord God, let it grow, and let us get to be able to share it with others as it flourishes within us. Holy Spirit, as always, you are welcome to show up in this service in whatever way you choose to manifest. Father God, we're here for one reason, one reason only, and that is to worship and praise you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're coming to Thanksgiving week. How many of you got your turkeys? You ready to go? I got to tell you that a lot of times Thanksgiving, I think, gets neglected. It gets a, a bad deal. Because we seem to go straight from Halloween, of which I have no use, and straight into Christmas which is, of course, worthy. But in the middle, we seem to lose Thanksgiving. If it wasn't for turkeys on sale or cranberry sauce in the shape of a can or whatever may happen to be on sale that day, we might not even know that Thanksgiving was here. It's just become an opportunity for some of us to come together and eat, and eat a lot. Marcy was going over our menu last night. She named this cake and this cake, and she said, well, that's not enough. What else we need? I'm like, good night. She said, what are you going to do? She said, well, we need to throw a pie. I said, well, I'm not going to stop you, whatever you think. But I'm hoping that in the midst of our menus that we're planning and our shopping list, that we're going to at least reserve some amount of time to be able to stop and thank God for what he's done, for what Thanksgiving exists for. You know, I think Thanksgiving has been overshadowed in recent years by Black Friday, and I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm going to try and show it through Scripture, that Black Friday is an antithesis to Thanksgiving. There is nothing we could have ever invented to be as opposite of the intents of Thanksgiving as Black Friday. On Thanksgiving, we come together and we give thanks. And Black Friday exists to tell us that, no, you don't, you don't have enough. You need more. You need more. You need more. Thanksgiving should exist in the spirit of what I'm going to talk about this morning, which is gratitude. And thanks and gratitude are two different things. And gratitude exists in the point that we have enough, and Black Friday exists in the fact that we will never have enough. And I believe without a doubt that we have enough. I believe we should find contentment I believe that the difference that shows on Thanksgiving and Black Friday shows that difference between thanks and gratitude I believe that we as the church we should be put forward out into this world as an embodiment of what gratitude looks like I believe that anybody that comes into this church should see a group of people gathered together that are so grateful for what they have been given of which they did not pay. So much that's been given to us that wasn't free. It had a cost, but the cost was not paid by us. I believe that we, as the church, should live ever in the attitude of gratitude. It sounds like a cliche, but it's not. That's exactly what gratitude is. It is our attitude. It is the way that we live our lives. You ask the question, what's the difference between thanks and, and gratitude? Well, this is what I say. I believe that we give thanks for what we get, but gratitude is being thankful for what we've already got. I think that is the entire difference. I believe that this world exists for no other purpose than to tell you and convince you that what you, ain't, what you got ain't enough. It might be money. They're going to try and tell you you need a bigger TV. You always need a bigger TV, right? You need a better car. You need a bigger house. You might need a younger spouse. 
I'm just telling you. They're going to tell you that there are things that you, are, that you need that replace what you have. They're going to put within you a discontentment. That's the only reason you can run sales and have people show up at midnight or 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning because they are not content with what they have. They have to have something else. They have to have something else. It amazes me you can get them out there at midnight at Walmart fighting over a $5 toaster. But I cannot get them to church at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning to hear and receive the Word of God, to accept salvation. Oh, it's too early. It's too early. Uh huh. And yet you saw them on Facebook or TikTok or whatever fighting over a crock pot. Last one I saw, they were in Marksville years ago fighting over towels. Who in the world is so desperate for towels? I was just, I was amazed. And I got to thinking, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a towel or a TV. It doesn't matter. It's just that somebody saw somebody going to get something that they didn't have. And if they're that desperate for it, then I, I need that too. Why can't they be that desperate for what we have here in the church? You know why? Because we as the church have not showed that it has the value. That is why. We have not run enough ads, if you want to say it, like Lions Grocery Store has for I don't know, whatever it happens to be, what turkey is, I don't know. I don't shop. Marcy does that. But they'll say, let's just say it's 10 cents a pound. Oh, that's good news. We need to all line up. We need to get over there. We need to go. We need to go. Whenever what we're sitting in here is given for free and has eternal value, and yet here we sit. We didn't have any problems finding a parking spot. We ain't parked out on the road. We didn't have to get a number coming in the door to be able to get a seat and get in line. And it's because we of the church have failed, not because Christ has failed. Scripture goes even farther in defining what our thanks is. Psalms chapter 136 verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures what? Forever. If you go buy one of these 85 inch TVs, it's probably good for what? Four or five years maybe? Even worse, what if you go buy a $1,000 washing machine? You lucky to get what, three years? One? We've been in our house 15 years. I, I, we are on our fifth washing machine. In the first 15 years of marriage before that, I think we had one. So these things that are out there that we have to have, let me tell you what they do not do. They do not endure forever. Thanks to the Lord. He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. So what we are offering here at the altars and in this church is something that endures forever. A lifetime plus warranty. You do understand that. Our warranty and what we receive from Christ exceeds our lifetime. I could give you a lifetime warranty, but he gives you something that's so much farther. He gives you eternal security. You're not going to get that from anything that you can buy. Gratitude is the only way to express our appreciation for what God has given us. But that gratitude must be continual. It must be just like that. Our gratitude must endure forever. Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. He said what? Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. I want you to look where that comma fits in there and a lot of times, Brother Michael will talk to us about if-then statements. And it tells us, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So if you are not thankful in all circumstances, that makes me fearful that you are not abiding by the second part, that you are not one of those who belongs to Christ Jesus. One of the biggest things facing everyone now is fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety. Depression. I, I, I'll never share it with y'all, but the messages I get, the emails that I get, the counseling sessions I do, they are 9 out of 10 now for fear, anxiety, and depression. Over and over and over and over again. And every point of time, I can almost find them that whenever they're coming back to the situation is because they are not fully relying upon Jesus Christ. 
You say, that's harsh, that's rough. It is, it's harsh and it's rough. Now, there are a few people that have had some, some physical issues, some chemical issues, if you will, and we get those worked out, and then they fall in under the will that Christ Jesus has given for them. But he says right there, be thankful in all circumstances. Are you thankful in all circumstances? What does that even look like? What, is that, what does it look like to be thankful in all circumstances? To be able to realize how you can be thankful in all circumstances, you have to imagine yourself in the worst possible circumstance. I'm not talking about broke down the side of the road with a flat and down the middle of the interstate. I've done that before. I'm not talking about whenever you're facing something in your marriage. I'm not talking about when you're facing something with your children. Those are all horrible, horrible circumstances. I'm talking about a circumstance even beyond that. And for that, we go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 to see where we are to be thankful. Romans 5, 6 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Romans 5, 8, we all know God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. When? While we were still sinners. When we were in the midst of the absolute worst circumstances, that's when he died for us. That's when he paid the price to get us up out of where we were. And why are we not running the aisles? Why are we not filling up the newspapers with stories every day saying, look what God gave to me. Look what the bargain that I got. I was a sinner and I was given eternal life. Facebook, like I said, they put me out in Facebook jail. They gave me partial parole. I have, I don't know, visitation rights or something. I post some things. I can't put videos. It, it's just, it's back and forth and back and forth. But whenever, I, I was looking this morning when I opened my eyes, I went to Facebook 3 o'clock this morning. I want to see what people are, people post at weird hours. People are up at odd points. I'm like, okay, you're posting at 1 o'clock in the morning. Let me see what you're seeing. You should be on there. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you, God, that you brought me this far. No, they're complaining about this, complaining about that, going on and on about the government or whoever. I'm like, I'm not interested in any of that. I'm not going to complain about the government because you know what? The people put the government there. I'm not going to be doing me good to complain about voters. I need to go talk to some voters and share them some Jesus. You can't change a vote. You have to change a heart. So why am I going to worry about all this politics stuff? I'm not. I'm going to go back to the root. People this morning, somebody was complaining about, oh, they need to put prayer back in schools. I'm like, no. You put prayer back in the home, then it could never leave the schools. How about this? How about you put prayer back in the church? I was watching a church service this morning while I was driving over. I, one of them popped up. I said, well, let me just play that while I'm going. I'm listening to all this kind of stuff. I don't hear any prayer. I'm like, I need to hear prayer. I need to go to a church service and know that someone there is talking to God and asking his presence to be in that building. That's what I need to hear. So I ain't going to worry about all that stuff. I ain't got time to be able to, to worry about this politician, that politician. I ain't got time to be able to worry about elections that they say, well, this one cheated, this one cheated, that one cheated. My Bible tells me that God sets up and God takes down kings. So what am, I going to what am I you going to tell me? Somebody cheated so much that they changed God's mind? They changed God's will? They changed God's intention? Look, if y'all football fans, you know that you've got to play better than the umpires, right? You can beat the other team, but you've got to beat them so bad that you can even beat the umpires, the referees. It's the same way with this world. Our God... His will far exceeds anything that anybody else comes up with. And I think sometimes we forget that and we get distracted. To me, that's the biggest thing that the devil has done. I think that's one reason why we're losing gratitude is that the one thing that the devil has put in this world, he put in here and he just went and sat down on the beach somewhere, is distraction. Once you take your eyes off of Jesus, then you will focus on anything but Jesus. And that's what he wants anything look a wonderful holiday set up by presidents a national holiday for no other reason than to sit down and thank god for what he's done so what do we do with it first thing we do what we put football games on it we put parades on it we do all these things that will set aside as the time to stop and thank god for what he did 
a national day of prayer and thanksgiving. I said, no, 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 you need to watch football. Okay, well, watch football, whatever. No, 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 you need to eat a lot. I, I went back, and I don't see anywhere in there where it said on the, when they set aside the day, it was the day to eat a lot. Because mainly what it is, that means on Friday, everybody's either in, in line at Walmart, like I said, to buy a $5 toaster, or they're in the ER because they're in congestive heart failure because they all ate way too much salt the day before. I've been in the hospital for 30 years, and the day I always dreaded to work was the day after Thanksgiving. And the Saturday was just as bad. Because Saturday was just as bad because they were so bad off Friday, they couldn't even get to the hospital. They were laid up. Gluttony. That's, that's nowhere in thanks and praise to God. Gluttony. Consumption of food, consumption of consumer products. Got to go buy a new cell phone, a new watch, a new whatever. That's, that's not intended. That's not what gratitude looks like. But gratitude is a choice. Gratitude is a lifestyle you have to choose. How many of you know the old people we had growing up? We lost a wonderful generation. Those who went up through the depression, you remember, they were grateful for everything. I have seen people wash tinfoil. <laughs> I especially have seen them wash those tin pans you bake your turkey in. Because they were grateful for what they had. When you see them driving a car 15, 20 years old, and they were grateful for it. We've lost that. We've lost that. But you know what? It's time to get it back. It's time to get it back. You must choose that lifestyle. You know what? One way or another, it's going to almost get back to that point. Just say you wanted a new truck this year. <laughs> I ordered one in February. I thought I wanted one. They called the other day. It's ready. Come pick it up. I'm like, nope. I said, you'll sell it to somebody else? They said, yeah, we will. I said, I'm just curious because I told them, get me a truck. I said, what you want for it? $88,000. I said, for sure you can keep it unless it's got three bedrooms, two and a half baths, and sits on about 10 acres. I ain't interested. So one way or another, you're going to have to learn to become content. How many of you know the shortages you've seen in the grocery stores? How many know it's getting worse? How many of you bought fertilizer this year? How many of you know what it's going to look like next year? If you don't choose contentment, if you don't choose a lifestyle of gratitude, it will be forced upon you. I'm telling you. And I'm worried about these younger generations. These ones, like you say, are when John mentioned one waving the the signs that say "Why kill animals when you can go to the grocery store?" You know, they don't know. It's the ignorance of the educated, and I worry and I fear, and I think that's going to put them in a sin where they are as opposite from contentment as you can be. You know, I used to laugh. Brother Donald used to say he preached from the two books, from the concordance. And from the dictionary. I went back over some notes the other day. I found one of my old notebooks. And I used to keep notes pretty diligently. And one of his sermons I went. And I started counting. 18 verses in that sermon. 18 verses. And I was sure there was at least two definitions. So I think I'm going to come up a little bit short. Not by much on the verses. But I do have at least one definition for it. Gratitude. What is gratitude? It comes from the Latin word gratis. Now, that's G-R-A-T-U-S. Because the other gratis, G-R-A-T-I-S, means free. And let me tell you, like they say, ain't nothing in this world free. The gifts we've given by God, our salvation, desperately were not free. We didn't pay it, but they were not free. But gratis simply means one thing. It means to praise to praise. This morning when it began to look like who's going to sing, this one can't come in, this one's out of town, this one's out of town, one's out of town, two's out of town, three calls in sick. You know what? Somebody else will stand up. My Bible tells me that if no one sings his praise, that what? The rocks will cry out. One way or another, someone is going to praise him and express that. But you know what? We must adopt that attitude of gratitude, which is simply an attitude of praise. 
And I know I have led music for years here. I lead music in Marksville. And it's hard to be able to stand up there and look at the people because you're trying so hard to instill something in them and some people just are not responding. There's no spirit of praise upon them. They're not actively participating. You know, I always wonder why is it that all the pastors sit on the front row with their back to the congregation? And I know why. (laughs) Ignorance is bliss, right? Don't know how many empty seats are here. Don't know how many people aren't singing or participating. Because you know what? As far as I know, I got one participating and one here, and that's me. I don't know where I got on that, but I did. Gratitude and praise are a choice. We have to make we have to make that choice. Even if you don't feel like it. You know the one and one time you need to praise God is when you don't feel like praising God. Vincent Van Gogh was a painter. Vincent Van Gogh said, when you don't feel like painting, that's the day to paint. It's the same thing. If you don't feel like praying, pray. You don't feel like praising, pray. When things are at the worst, we must remember the command given to us in Scripture. We're going to go to Isaiah. We'll be in Isaiah a lot in December. We're going to go to Isaiah today. It says, we're told to do this, to appoint it to them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them what? Beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and here's my favorite, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All those things he gives us for what reason? So that he may be glorified. To give us the garment of praise. Everyone in you, I'm guessing this morning, dressed themselves this morning. I don't know for a fact, but I'm assuming everyone here dressed themselves. You may not have chose what to put on. Somebody may have laid it out for you. But you put it on yourself. You made that conscious decision. Let me tell you, to take off the spirit of heaviness and then put on the garment of praise, it's the same thing. It's a choice. You have to do it. How many of you know what the spirit of heaviness is? You ever felt it? You ever had at some point in time where maybe even the community where you are or the family that you're in or maybe where you work or maybe just you sitting alone in a chair and you feel a literal spirit of heaviness? It's real. I used to put it as spirit with a little s. It was just something that came upon me. But I believe it is an actual capital S thing. I believe that that spirit of heaviness is something that we need to cast aside that it physically exists for no other reason than to keep us down. I believe it tried its best to set itself upon this congregation, and we said no. We cast off the spirit of heaviness, and instead we put on the garment of praise. We must choose to do that. The world is dumping on you so much negativity, so much negativity all day long. Like I said, of social media or Lord forbid you try and watch any of the news. They're just going to dump me. I don't care what initials are in the corner of the state news station you watch. They're all going to put negativity on you. They're just going to keep pouring that upon you. Even between the news sections, when the commercials come on, the commercials are telling you what? Like I said, you don't have enough. You need more. You need to take this drug. You need to go see this lawyer. You go see this lawyer because why? Because I'm driving a big truck and I got all this property. I'm on my lake on my porch because I use lawyer such and such and such and such. It didn't tell me anything about how you got your body healed, but you got a big check. You need more. You need more. You need more. You don't need more. You need Jesus. I try to find a fancy way to say it. You just need Jesus. You ever tell somebody that? You need Jesus. Tell you what, in the morning when you're brushing your teeth, look in the mirror and say, you need Jesus. I mean, I know some of you, it's easy to brush your teeth. You just put them in your hand. But the rest of you that are still looking in a, those the rest of you are still looking in a mirror, tell them you need Jesus. Because that's all they need. These lawyers pay thousands of dollars a minute to be on while I'm trying to watch the weather in Jambalaya on the, in the morning. They're paying these thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to be able to get their message out. What are we doing? What are we doing? We're just sitting back, like you say, Uncle. We're just sitting back. The world tells us, you know what? If you buy what I'm selling, you're going to be happy. 
Let me tell you this. You go out on Black Friday, you run up your credit card. Black Saturday, you're still going to be unhappy and you're going to be broke. In 28 days, you're going to get a bill. Now, God forbid you're going to get a note every month because you got really stupid. But you're still going to be unhappy. You're going to have what they used to call that buyer's regret. You're going to have that quick. I don't know anyone that's ever come to the altar and received Christ that walked away with buyer's regret. The garment of praise, the attitude of praise, it stays with you. It's paid for. You know, don't expect a bill. The bill's been paid. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 says, You are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. I love the, the band Ren Collective. They're a band, but they're actually more of a praise and worship. And I love their concerts, and I'm, I'm, I'm back and forth communicating with them. And they have one of their songs that they sing, and it comes straight out of Scripture. It says, you're the pearl beyond price, greater than life. All that I am for all that you are. God gave me all that he had in exchange for what I had, which was what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We used to sing the song that said, I come to my hand, I come to the cross, nothing do I bring. Nothing. And God gave for us everything. He gave us the life of Christ and he gave us an eternal life. On this or any Sunday here at this altar and this coming Thanksgiving Thursday around our dining room table, you can come together. And many of you will put your hands together and you're going to what? You're going to give thanks. But gratitude is thankfulness. Thankfulness is being full of thanks at all time. So it's wonderful to come up here to praise God, worship God. Wonderful to pray around a table and thank Him for that, mood, that food. Like I told y'all last week when we sit down, pray, Lord God, that this fried turkey will be used as nourishment into my body. It's wonderful to give thanks, but we should always be in that spirit of gratitude. Thankfulness, full of thanks at all time. It's an outward expression of an internal contentment. If you know someone who is not continually thankful, it's because they are never content. You may know somebody like that. I don't want you to see you elbowing anybody or tapping them on the shoulder. You may know someone who is never content. Whenever we got so many things, well, you don't know my life. Well, let me just show you a little, a little snippet of Paul's life. Paul said this. He said, five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes less one. That's 39 lashes for those of you who are hard at math. But he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, listen to this, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold, and exposure. But Paul doesn't leave us hanging there. Philippians 4, 11 through 13, he says, What? Not that I was ever in need. I wish when I wrote this sermon, that when I got to that point, I said, I wish I would have just wrote those words down and had nothing before them and nothing after them. Because that is everything right there. Not that I was ever in need. Now, he went on to explain it. He said, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can endure through Christ who gives me strength. A lot of times we read that last verse and we say, we read that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you go back and look at the literal interpretation, it says, I can endure all things through Christ Jesus. 
So I can do all things. Steph Curry has that scripture on his tennis shoes. I've watched Steph Curry play basketball. I can't do all things. I can't shoot three points like he can. But you know what I can do? I can endure all things through Christ Jesus. He said there, whether my stomach is empty or my stomach is full. You know, it's awfully easy to say grace over a full plate, right? Ever try to say grace over an empty plate? I've heard the stories of the ones who came up in the 20s where they stood in an empty pantry and thanked God for his provision. Thanked God for an empty cupboard because they knew what? They were never in need. They've learned how to be content with whatever they have or don't have. That's what trust, that's what gratitude looks like. This is Paul's definition of gratitude we should all try to live up to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. What? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus in you. Again, an if-then statement. If you cannot do those things, then is Christ Jesus in you? Whenever doubt comes up, when negativity comes up, begin to take an assessment on yourself. Maybe your heart is as empty as that cupboard. Maybe you haven't put the things up that you needed to. You haven't built up your faith in God. Gratitude like joy should be eternal. You do realize there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is fleeting. Joy is eternal. Thanks is temporary. Gratitude is eternal. We continue to show that, to continue to give him thanks through our gratitude. Let's continually put on the garment of praise. Let's take off that spirit of heaviness. Remember that as you come into Thanksgiving. Gratitude is praise. You know, there's a certain part of our family that gets together every year. And one year we weren't able to make it. And they told me the story that 25 of them were gathered together and it was time to bless the food. And they all started looking around. They said, well, we need, to say, we need to say grace. And they all began to look around the table and look around the table and look around the table. And one of them told me the story, said she just started crying because there was not a person in that room that even knew what to do, didn't know how to say grace. And I began to, I began to cry, not because they did not have the ability to give thanks unto God, but because I had been with them every year for years and years and years, and I had never made the effort to make sure that when I was not there, that there was not a representation of Christ somewhere in that room. I began to cry because I had failed. I didn't cry because they didn't know, because they don't know. Remember this, lost people do lost things. Don't judge them. Go to them, pray with them. Let them see your gratitude in the times when things aren't going the right way. And that's the only way you're going to teach them and lead them to the word of God. Is that they see it as a truth and a reality in you. So gratitude is praise. So how are you going to thank God? How are you going to show your gratitude? You're going to praise him. Four o'clock in this morning I was in my study and I was singing. Praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning. Praise him at the noon time. Praise him, praise him, praise him when the sun goes down. That's my charge to you. Right now when it gets dark at 4.30, <laughs> praise him. I haven't been praising him at 4.30. I got stuff I need to do. But you know what I need to do? I need to praise him. When things aren't going my way, I need to stop and I need to praise him. I don't need to go to Facebook and complain about it. I need to give him praise and I need to give him thanks and give him glory. And that's what I'm going to do. Today is Thanksgiving. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. Every day that the good Lord allows you to open your eyes and set your feet upon the floor, it's Thanksgiving. Lord God, we come before you. We come before you with repentant hearts. Because, Father God, we have not been thankful as we should be, me included. Lord God, we have not been 
a people of gratitude as we should be. Lord God, you, somebody may ask, well, how do, you, how do you know that we haven't? It's because I see the empty pews. It's because I see those who gather around the table and cannot even offer up prayers. Lord God, we have not shown our gratitude because we have not shown love to your children, to our fellow brothers and sisters, Lord God, that you place in our care. Father God, I proclaim this year going forward that for us to show our gratitude, for us to show our thanks, Lord God, that the way we're going to do that is that we're going to share your love with others. That, Father God, we are going to be the ones who give you thanks in the midst of what this world brings against us. Father God, interest rates are up. Inflation's up. And we're going to be the only ones out there saying, Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Because you sit upon the throne. Father God, how can we worry about mortgage rates when you own not only the cattle on the thousand hills, but you own the thousand hills, and like it says, even the gold in them, their hills. Everything's yours, Father God. How can we not be grateful? Father God, we hold nothing in our hands. We come to you, Lord God, and ask that you instill within us that spirit of praise that we must choose. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak against that spirit of heaviness. You are not welcome here. You are not welcome in this community. You are not welcome in the lives of anyone in this congregation. I pray that the spirit of praise replaces that spirit of heaviness. That spirit of heaviness may have the name of anxiety or depression, fear, Drugs, addiction, I don't care what name that demon chooses. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that it be gone. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given us the power and authority through your son, Jesus Christ, to be able to speak to those things which are as though they were not and those things which are not as though they were. And Lord God, I speak even now that the spirit of praise falls upon this people as the spirit of heaviness is lifted. Father God, let us go forth in this place, Lord God, as a people known to be the people of the word, the people of the spirit, and the people that inhabit, Lord God, your presence. Because you are within us, Lord God, because you say that you have inhabited the praises of your people. I thank you, Lord God, and I pray a blessing upon all those here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Leave from this place with praise, with honor, and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a glorious week.